God bless you today. And happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers. Let's give all of the mothers a hand. <laughs> Hands that rock the cradle. Hands that rude world. We really run this thing. Y'all don't know it, but we run this thing. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. And we just thank God for giving us that position as mother. Amen. It's an humbling position. I tell you what, it's an humbling position because a lot of times uh, as a mother, you do things that uh, you have to do so that things can go on the way they need to go on. Amen. Sometimes you do things you don't want to do so things can go on. Amen. But I tell you what, we're blessed, every one of us. We all have a mother or, you know, even if our mother's deceased, um, you know, we're blessed to have had a mother. And this morning I'm asking you for special prayer for Mother Nun, whose mother passed this morning. I want you to uh, keep that family in prayer this morning. Um, that's a hard, hard thing. And, uh, you know, we, we know Mother Nun, our sister, my mother. We know how hard she loves. And we know she loved her mom. Amen. Mother Nun's been there for her mother, and that's a hard, hard thing. And I just want you all to keep that family. We have several family members here. Uh, so that would be the grandmother and then the great-grandmother of several of our members. So we want to definitely keep them in prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we'll get out of our cells for a moment and we'll pray for uh, somebody else and it will help us to feel better. You believe that? Yes. Amen. So we're going to go on and do what we're tasked to do this morning. Uh, even though our hearts are heavy, we're going to go on and uh, uh, continue our study in the United Kingdom stage. So we're in 1 Samuel. I would that you would turn to 1 Samuel, the 12th chapter. Turn to 1 Samuel, the 12th chapter. So we, as we were ending up uh, last Sunday, um, Saul had, uh, had a victory against the Ammonites. Saul had had a victory against the Ammonites, and we were ending up last Sunday. Um, he had raised up an army of 330,000 men to rescue Jabesh Gilead from Nahash. You remember that, us talking about Nahash and how cruel he was and that the men, he said, well, you know, I'll leave you alone if y'all just give me your right eye. And so remember I said that Nahash's name meant snake and that he was a horrible, horrible man. So he was cruel. He didn't, you know, just whatever. And so uh, Saul was able, at this time, Israel did not have a standing army. So whenever they had to go up and go out against somebody, they had to call the people together. So it's different when you just have an army standing ready. You know, Israel, they were not not really fighters. They just kind of had to be taught. So they really should have really been grateful to God because God, God taught them everything that they needed to do in order for them to be victorious against their enemies. It was God's doing. Everything that they experienced, every success, the victory, it was God's doing. It was not any, in any ability they had because they were like really farmers and they had to come together to fight. And the army that they did have at this time, you're going to see that they didn't really even have the proper weapons that they needed to go up armies like the Ammonites and the Philistines. So they really needed to depend on the Lord. It's something, though, when you know you need to depend on the Lord, but you're going in the opposite direction. You're going in the opposite direction. So in, in, instead of them depending on the Lord, they said, give us a king so that he can reign over us, so that he can judge us, so that we will be victorious against our enemies. Not realizing all the time that uh, the only way that they could be is if God was with them. God was with them. That would be an Ebenezer moment. And that, that's what uh, Samuel said, an Ebenezer moment where they would remember hitherto had the Lord helped us. 
hitherto have the Lord helped us. And so uh, him raising up that army, calling those people together, 330,000, that would kind of establish his ability to lead. But what we're going to find out is that he was leading basically in his own strength. Now, he, be he started out giving the glory to God. And we kind of like that sometimes. When we, when we get something, you know, we get, a God, we get a good promotion on our job. We start out, God be the glory. But when we stay on the job just a little while, we begin to think that it's something that we did. Uh, Robert, I do need for you to turn the air on just a little bit, please. Get it circulating just a little. And so he started out giving the glory to God. But later on, we're going to see he got full of pride. And do you know that pride is something that can bring you down really, really quickly? Can bring you down really quickly. Uh, and uh, uh, it's something that a lot of times we don't know we have uh, somebody, you know, you, we, we're the last one to know that we we're full of pride. The last one to know that we're full of pride. I heard somebody say uh, one time that, well, you know, I'm really, I'm a pretty humble person. But I heard this, that the first time you say you're humble, that's when you know you're not. You're, you're really not. If you got to say you're humble, I believe humility is something that someone else should say about you. I believe it's something that someone else should ascribe to you. But if you're walking around thinking you're humble, you're really not humble. You're prideful. And so... Uh, at Mizpah, we, when we go back over to chapter 11, at Mizpah, they had accepted uh, Saul as God's king. And Saul, you know, he just, uh, Samuel presented them at, at, as God's king. But now they're at Gilgal. So look at chapter 11, verse 15. Samuel called them to Gilgal. And at Gilgal, they're going to confirm Saul as king, sort of like a coronation, you know, when that you see on uh, uh, the... Uh, kings and queens uh, over in England. They have this big, big thing, a big coronation. And so in 1 Samuel, the 11th chapter, and all the people, the 15th verse, the 11th chapter and the 15th verse, and all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king. They had a coronation of sorts before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. The men of Israel rejoiced greatly. They rejoiced greatly. Why? Because they're getting their way. And as I said last Sunday, none of us are as happy as when we're getting our own way. I'm talking about myself right now. I'm happy when I'm doing what I want to do. I'm happy when I'm getting my own way, not knowing that sometimes when I'm getting my own way, I'm leading my own self into destruction. Yeah. And Samuel said unto all Israel in chapter 12, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that you said unto me and have made a king over you. So now Samuel is getting ready to lead them into an act of dedication, into an act of uh, spiritual revival and dedication. And uh, here Samuel is going to take this opportunity over in chapter 11 and verse 14. He says here, uh, then Samuel said to the people, come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. Renew the kingdom there. Let's make a change. Let's do something different. Because Samuel realized, Brother Foster, the condition that Israel had sunken down, the degradation, the loneliness that they had fallen into. He realized that it was time for a change. And so he said, now come, let us go and renew the kingdom. So he saw this where they're now here at Gilgal. He's presenting the king. This is an opportunity to renew the kingdom. But he also reminded them that it was God, Jehovah God, who was really still their king. He was the real king. He was the real king. And so now uh, the fact that Saul had led the army in a great victory against Nahash, against the Ammonites, uh, would tempt them into putting their faith in Saul. 
Hmm, but how many of you know it's, 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 that's trouble when you begin to put your faith in someone that has the same power or less than you? And we, we have a tendency to do that. We have a tendency to look at some people and think that uh, because of the position they're in, because of the power that they hold, that there's something special about them. But if you're pulling on your pants the same way that I pull on mine, you got the same power that I have. Amen. You can fall into the same traps that I can fall into. I can fall into the same traps that you can fall into. And so it would be ludicrous, it would be foolish for me to put my faith in someone who's just like me. That's why we depend and we lean on God. And so uh, he wanted them to know now, Samuel wanted them to know, now you, you got a king, but God is the real king. And if you're going to be successful at all in the future, you have to realize and you have to acknowledge him as king. Now, it's one thing to know that he's sitting on the throne but it's another thing to acknowledge that he is God yes. and that he's the one with the ability. And so he wanted them to know that the success rested, their future success rested in him alone. And so he gathers them at Gilgal here in chapter 12. And this is going to be his last, his last recorded sermon because now remember he is a judge. Samuel is a judge. So when, when, when the king comes on the scene, the judges fall off the scene because there's no need for them. God had appointed them there. He had appointed them there for the purpose of acting, uh, serving, judging for the people and uh, giving them the word of God. But now they have a king. And so now they don't need a judge. That's what they wanted. They wanted a king. But before leaving office, Samuel had to set the record straight. He had to set the record straight and he had to bear witness that his hands were clean. As a judge, Samuel had to set the record straight. His hands were clean and that the people could find no fault in him. Let's read. He says, and now behold, in uh, chapter 12, verse 2. And now behold, the king walketh before you, the one you asked me to place before you, the one, the, 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 the man that you wanted to lead you, the man that you wanted to be able to see because the other nations around you had a king. And behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. And none of them could deny that. Because some of them were there when his mom came and dedicated him back to the Lord. The said, Lord, if you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. And that's what she did. And he served from his childhood all the way up to now. The Bible says now he's gray-headed. So now he's been serving God all this time. And so Samuel said, none of you can say anything any different about me. You saw me. You saw me as a child and you saw me uh, uh, mature and come up until the office that I'm holding now. He says, behold, here I am, verse 3, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? And so he goes on to say here, I want you to look at me because what, what, what transpires, what trans was transpiring back then is that people who had offices in that culture were uh, oftentimes, they were, uh, what is the word? They were shady. They were shady. They, thank you, they were corrupt. They did not walk uprightly. They did not do what was just before the Lord. And so uh, Samuel wanted them to know, you can't say that about me. And so uh, when he began to talk to them, he says uh, in verse four, and they said, the people said, thou have not defrauded us nor oppressed us. Neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. And now Samuel is getting ready to review Israel's history from Moses up until his own day, 
And he's going to emphasize God's grace and what God has done for them. And I've, as I told you in the past, when anybody ever wanted to uh, talk about God's glory, they would always go back to the past to tell them, or remind Israel. See, they had to be reminded time after time after time. They had to be reminded of where God had brought them from. Because they, they forgot so easily. They forgot so easily. So they had to be reminded of where God had brought them from, another Ebenezer moment, so that they would not get to this point where now they have a king and think that, okay, we were down in Egypt. We uh, needed someone to deliver us, uh, but we delivered ourselves. Someone, somebody got to have to remind them every time. Y'all didn't deliver yourselves. It was God. At every juncture in your history, God showed himself mighty and showed himself strong. And so he reminds them about God's grace. It was God's grace. It was not anything that you had done. It was not because you were uh, the best and the brightest. Uh, as a matter of fact, you were the least. Ezekiel says that when God found you, I found you on the side of the road. I found you in the, on the side of the road, and not only were you on the side of the road, but I found you struggling in your own blood. But I picked you up, and I cleaned you up, and I made you something that I could, I could bring to myself and call my own. I did that. I did that. And so uh, whenever someone has to, to, to go and talk about God's glory, they go to, God, uh, to Israel's history. You were nothing. Well, nothing. As a matter of fact, you were in bondage. You were in bondage down in, in, in Egypt, and, and you were crying out. You were crying out by way of the hard taskmaster. Made it so hard. He said, you make bricks, but you make the bricks without straw. You work hard for your money. Uh, but uh, they worked harder and harder, and the harder they worked, the, the, the harder that the taskmasters got. And so they cried out to God. And isn't God just a merciful God? Yeah. Isn't he just a merciful God? How many times have you cried out to God knowing that you have not done everything that you were supposed to do? Knowing that you could have done some things differently. Knowing that you could have uh, not done some things. But you called out anyway and he came through. Yeah. Won't he come through? Yeah. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it. In spite of you. In spite of me. I thank God for that. And that's when Pastor Blaine, I thank God that he's God, Sister Brenda Green, and uh, you're not. Because, see, when I would call out to you, you would say, wait, now you remember I helped you the last time. And the last time you didn't do right. And then, and, and then a lot of times we say, you know, what? And, and then I helped you the last time. And you didn't pay me back from the last time I helped you. Huh? Come on, somebody. We, and that's when we get a good memory. Now, we can't remember nothing else good, but we can go back and remember. No, you didn't do me right the last time. So now I'm going to have to think real hard before I help you again. And some of us, ooh, we have a long memory. We'll bring up stuff from 15 years back. Now, I remember when, but God is not like that. Thank God that he's not like that. Thank God that he's a merciful God. And so Samuel not only brings up the history and reminds them about God's grace uh, that he has extended them down to you. He just, you know, he read them from when they were down in Egypt up to the point where they are now. And he says in verse 12, and when ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, ye said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. Now therefore, behold the king whom you have chosen and whom ye have desired, and behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. He's getting ready now to warn the people about their uh, king, and he's going to warn them about the foolishness of disobeying God. 
So in verse uh, 25, in verse 25, he says, but if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed. Not only you, but you and your king, the one you asked for. And then uh, God, look at uh, ch uh, chapter 12 and look at verse uh, 18. It says, um, well, let me, let me just start up here because God is going to emphasize the warning that Samuel's giving them by a sign of uh, uh, thunder and rain. This is a season of wheat harvest and none of that should have been happening. But now God is getting ready to show them whatever he's saying, I'm agreeing with what he's saying. Don't get it twisted. I'm agreeing with what he's saying. And so uh, in verse 15, let me just start there. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. Now, therefore, stand and see this great thing. You just come, 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 come and just listen. I'm calling you out now. And you, you know, you calling me out like you want a king. Now I'm, I'm calling you out so that you can, can, can uh, hear what's going to happen. He says, now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not sweet harvest today? I will call unto the Lord and he shall send thunder and rain that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. He's letting them know, you know, it's still not cool. You got what you wanted, but it's still not cool. So Samuel called unto the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And so now we're, we're going over to chapter 13. And in the next, uh, the next several chapters, the next several chapters, uh, it focuses on uh, Saul's early reign as king, and especially on the relationship that he had with God and with Samuel. And what we're going to see, even as king, as I said earlier, he started out giving the glory to God. But in these chapters, chapters 13 through 15, we're going to see him to begin making some foolish and unwise decisions. Does that sound like somebody you know, like uh, number 45? making some foolish and unwise decisions. And y'all, when you have a leader over you making foolish and unwise decisions, it's praying time. These are perilous times. These are perilous times. We don't know from one day to the next when we get up what the headline is gonna say that what, ha what, what decision was made in uh, Washington, D.C. So we have to pray because he is in, we have to pray and we have to ask God to help us in these perilous times, help us in these perilous times. So, and then he, 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 we see him in the decisions that he's making, trying to cover up what he's doing with uh, his disobedience, trying to cover him up with lies. And y'all know how hard it is to cover up something with a lie, because you tell one lie, you got to tell another one. And then, you know, you know, you know, and I'm just talking about me right now. I tell, you know, you tell them so, you forget what you said. If you got somebody with a memory that, no, nah, that's, uh, that's not what you said the last time. That's not what you said the last time. And so Saul's going to find out. And this is when, you know, uh, the people, you begin to realize, uh, were you really wise in asking for a king? Remember, again, he's someone who's frail just like you. Someone who makes mistakes just like you. Yes. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He is in control of everything. He, he, he works everything. He works it all for his own purpose, for his, for his own glory. He does. He does that. You're right about that. And so uh, in, verse, in chapter 13, verse 1, we see where Saul had reigned uh, 
uh, two years when he began to establish a standing army. Remember I said that, you know, when he got the 330,000 together, there was not, that was not a standing army. But in chapter 13, verse 1, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash, and in Mount Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan, that's Jonathan is his son here in Gibeah of Benjamin, and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison. We're gonna see Jonathan is going to end up being a, a good soldier. But we see right here where Jonathan is getting ready to get a victory, but Saul is gonna take credit for it. <laughs> now, you know, that might have been all right if it had been somebody else, but that's your daddy. You, you know, your, your daddy going to do you like that? And so he says, Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Gibba. Excuse me. And the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the line, land, saying, let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that who had smitten a garrison, that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had in abomination with the Philistines, and the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. How many? 30,000. 30, now, how many does, uh, does Israel have? Do you, how many? 3,000. Two was with Saul and 1,000 with Jonathan. So now already they're outnumbered, all right? But we know God. God, it doesn't take but a few with God. It only took a few with God with Gideon. It only takes a few with God. As a matter of fact, God doesn't have to have anything. He can take nothing and make something happen. He can't do it. And so the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight. They had uh, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as a sand, which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from Beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks, and in high places, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal. And all the people followed him trembling. And so now they're paralyzed with fright. They're scared because they see that they're greatly outnumbered. And again, remember I said that they didn't really even have the weapons that they needed to fight. So you have the Philistines who have a great army and they have great uh, military uh, ability. They're fighters, they're soldiers, they're real soldiers. Uh, you know, a real soldier, when in time of, uh, of war, they don't run, they don't run. They stand up and fight. But these men, they're scared. So they run to the caves and they hide, they cross the river. Some of them, some of them desert the army, they cross on over the river and go, you know. And, and uh, the ones who stayed there were too scared to really do anything. And so uh, Samuel, back over in the earlier chapter, Samuel had commanded Saul to go to Gilgal and you wait. You wait. Wait for seven days. It's over in chapter 10 and uh, verse 8, I believe. Chapter 10 and verse 8. He says, And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to offer sacrifices or peace offerings, because now that, that was only... A reserve, that duty was reserved for who? Priest. It was reserved for the priest. Okay? It says, you go down to Gilgal and wait for me, and I will come to offer burnt offerings and a sacrifice peace offering. Seven days shall thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. 
Okay, so now we come to the point where uh, in chapter 13, verse 8, Saul is waiting. <laughs> and he's waiting. He's waiting. He tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered before him. So now he's waiting, and he sees that his army is melting away, and that the uh, Philistines, they're steady mobilizing. They're steady getting ready to attack. And so now the situation seems hopeless. But how many of you know that when the situation seems hopeless, that's when God steps in and God makes a way out of no way, out of a hopeless situation. Oh, I'm talking about what I know he'll do. Take a hopeless situation and give you hope. He will encourage you even through a hopeless situation. So now I have a little uh, exercise, a little task for you. I want you to talk about it. Um, let's talk about it. I want you to get into some groups, and I want you to talk about this. How is unbelief and impatience a sign of spiritual immaturity? And I want you to answer the question, what are the challenges of waiting on God's timing? And then I want you to ask, uh, answer, what are the benefits of waiting on God's timing? So now I believe all of you all on this side can be a group and let's make ourselves over here two groups and let's stop right there with uh, Brother um, Frankie Beverly, I can't think of your name, Brother Davis. <laughs> Brother Davis, let's make Brother Davis up to here one group and let's make Tara back there. Let's make all of that one group. All right? Okay. Okay, and so Brother Davis and Sister Leela, y'all need to come, I think, move. Y'all need to move up to this front row so that y'all can, uh, Dorothy can turn around. Dorothy has a little trouble kind of getting back there. So y'all come on up to this front row or to the second row. It doesn't matter. And then y'all just, just make yourselves one group. All right? So you see the questions and you see the task? All right? There you go. All righty then. That Samuel had told him to, but he began to get impatient. And so he saw, as I said earlier, that the people, as the verse says, is scattered before him. And so now it looks like, uh, it looks like my situation is hopeless. So it looks like now that I need to take some action because Samuel, you're not coming like you said you were going to come. So now something has to take place. And Saul said, bring me a burnt off. Bring me a burnt offering, a peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon, see, you stepped out of, your, of the timing. You, you're, you're, you're impatient. As soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. Just like he said he would. But now you, you, you're looking out of your eye gate. You're not, you're walking by sight. And you're walking by what you're feeling. So now you're, 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 you're stepping out. You're stepping outside of, of, of the timing of God. So now let's hear your discussion. We're going to start back here with uh, Sister Madeline's group, and let's hear what you all said. And uh, Pastor Bland, if you have the, uh, someone has the, do I have a microphone? Uh, oh, okay. It may just be on mute because I think we tried it before we started. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll take that. Uh, that means someone's going to have to come on up here to this mic. Somebody, two or three of y'all, somebody, but somebody need to come up here to this mic. Hmm? Thank you. 
That Mother Brewer's daughter. Looking like Mother Brewer. Good morning. Good morning. Um, are we just asking? You just, you just go as your group has uh, instructed you. I'm sure they gave you some good instructions. Okay, and, and our <laughs> last talk about it, it said, how is unbelief an impatient a sign, an impatient a sign of spiritual immaturity? Mm -hmm. And we um, decided that, well, it's like when you're not, when you're a babe in Christ, you have to be able to, when you spend more time with God, it, it causes you to be more, more mature. It's not, my decision was like, um, is, it really an un, is it really a sign of, of spiritual immaturity if you don't know? Do you have making any sense to you? Um, what else did we just talk? Yeah, yeah, help her out. Help her out. We were not trusting God, and right. the older you get, the better you. Are. You, the, the longer you live, and the older you get, you're supposed to learn better. You're supposed to study God's word. You should study God's word, and then you'll learn better, and then you, you know, you won't be so immature. Right. So we said it, it is a sign of spiritual immaturity. Okay. All right. What else? And what are the challenges of waiting on God's timing? What did we decide on that? <laughs> We said that one of the challenges of waiting on God's timing that you worry. You know, you're just going to be worrying yourself. And, and mm -hmm. if you just don't challenge God's timing and just trust him, you won't be worrying. And if you worry, you know, that brings on, could bring on a lot of other issues. Okay. Yeah. True. <laughs> y'all agree with that? Yeah. Uh, y'all agree with that? Okay. And then the benefits of waiting on God's timing is if you know it's God, if you wait on when he does it, he does it right. And he does it on time. Come on now. Because the word tells us that those that wait up on the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up his wings as eagles. And I just believe that if you just trust and when you wait on him, it has no other choice but to be right. All right. All right. Praise the Lord. Okay. Any questions for that group? Any, any questions? All right. Let's move up here to this group. Who's speaking? Oh, oh and you you have you want to you want to say something? We all gonna speak. Oh, okay. <laughs> like he's talking like he's the ruler of that group. <laughs> he's, he's the boss of y'all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, what what we the first one is high is unbelief and impatience is a sign of spiritual immaturity. I think that uh, what, what we came up with is uh, that if you don't have faith in God and trust in him or, or whatever that in your patience is weak, that's a sign of spiritual immaturity. Okay. All right. And so that's not the, so in what are the challenges of waiting on God's timing? I think all that comes from not being, you have to have patience in order to wait on God's on God to do, to deliver because if you try to uh do something on your own or try to move outside of God's timing you will end up being defeated you're going to defeat your own purpose okay okay so these are the things that that's what I have for that and so what are the benefits of waiting on God's timing is uh i would say again patient again am i right okay so, all right now I'm Okay. You, you said one of the benefits of waiting on God's timing is you grow. You know, that, that you become, that faith builds even more because of his time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Frankie. And thank you, Sister Jean. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day, first of all. Happy Mother's uh, Day. This is, uh, this is interesting. I just read something that said uh, that has to do with all of this. Uh, and first of all, spirituality, I believe, has to do with you and the creator, the higher energy source. It has nothing to do with nobody else. It's one's personal belief with God. If you're in tune with God, you are spiritual. That's just my personal belief. I read something that said uh, you'll always be depressed of living in the past. You always, have uh, you always be anxious and have anxiety when you're living in the future. But you always be at peace 
when you're in the present. And so I just think that you're all the way out of line when you're impatient. And I think I suffer with impatience with anything, man. So it's all the way out of God. You're all the way off center when you're impatient. Uh, it's not a fruit of the spirit. You know, the fruit, one of the fruits of the spirit is patience. You know what I mean? So God doesn't teach us that. And so uh, unbelief is just lacking faith, man. You're lacking faith when you don't trust that God can do who he says you, he is. You fell out of line. You got off center. And now you are taking God's place, and now you God. So whenever you God, you all the way out of whack. So <laughs> I'm done with that. I can go on and on. There you, go. you give it back to him. All right. All right. Thank you. Any questions to this group? And we're going to bring it to a close. Uh, but we're going to hear from the last group, and then we're going to bring it to a close. Okay, and we don't have time for y'all to decide who's speaking. We need to have somebody to speak. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Mother's Day to the mothers. Uh, uh, the, the number one question of spiritual immaturity. Uh, what I learned this morning, if we get out of self and let God do it. Okay. Because we're not believing God. And I was speaking for myself this morning because in, in, in my unbelief and what I had been taught about God, then I just thought, you know, I need to help God out because he's not coming fast as I want him to come. But then the Spirit spoke and said, this is a faith walk. So I, he had to teach me how to walk by faith. And said, what are the challenges of waiting on God's timing? Uh, what they were saying is, uh, he's not through with me yet. Mm -hmm. So I got to wait on him while he's doing what he's doing to me and for me. And what is, are the, the benefits of waiting on God's timing? Uh, there are so many benefits. Like you say, there's God just, he just pick you up and, and show you who he is by the things that he does for you. Because he knows that you believe what he said he would do, that he will do. And if we wait on him and not be like Saul, going to help, you know, because Samuel didn't come. But if we just wait on God, then he will uh, elevate you to where he wants you to be. And it takes step by step, one day at a time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's give all the groups a hand. Okay, so uh, it takes something. Thank you all for participating. And as I'm closing, I, I enjoyed the comments. I truly do believe that when one of the, the biggest challenge of waiting on God is that you become anxious. You begin to worry, as Saul did. Oh, Samuel's not coming, so now I got to do something. I got to do something. I got to come up with a plan. I got to come up with a strategy. Uh, but you are walking outside of God's timing. And how many of you know that God's timing is the right timing? It's the right timing. The Bible says that he watches over his word to perform it. He watches over his word. He sent the word out. He knows what he's saying. And he knows what he wants to do about it. And he knows when he wants to act on it. He doesn't need your help with anything. He doesn't need your help. God has it already planned out. And he's just waiting on you to get in line with his timing. To get outside of yourself and stop thinking that you got. And that you can help him out. Because you can't. We don't have that much sense. Give the Lord a hand, praise everybody.